From Cross Culture Church in Raleigh, this is Crosswalk. Picking up where we left off last week, today Pastor Clay wants to help us recognize one other truth from James chapter 4, verses 6 through 10, before moving on to the rest of the chapter where James is going to help us see that some things are God's business and not ours. Being judgmental is not something that followers of Jesus should display. As James is going to explain, there's really only one judge. Pastor Clay is going to explain what that passage means for us and what it doesn't mean. Now here's Pastor Clay. Hey, I don't know if y'all have noticed this or not, but there is some crazy stuff going on in the world. (laughs) I'm just saying, there is some crazy stuff going on in the world. And half of it, you know, I I, I confess, I'm sometimes bad about not catching the news. And uh, my wife has to fill me in, or or Travis has to fill me in, somebody has to fill me in on some of the stuff. So some of it I was not aware aware of, and... uh, uh, But... You know, some of it I have been keeping up with, but it's just, it's just so much stuff. It seems like there's so much turmoil, so much crazy stuff going on in the world. And now uh, Syria has, has, uh, has been, you know, the, the Russians have moved into Syria. Did y'all, did y'all hear about that? <laughs> the Russians, Russians have, have moved into Syria, right? And then now uh, this big announcement about all this, these uh, oil deposits that Israel uh, has announced that they have, that they've discovered... Uh, and they just happen to lie in, in, in what the Golan Heights, a part of Israel that's considered uh, disputed territory because Israel uh, took it, technically took it back uh, from Syria in, uh, in 1967 in what's called the Six-Day War when Syria uh, attacked Israel and uh, Israel kicked her behind and sent her back across the border and, and, and took, took the Golan Heights. And so now, you know, Syria's saying, hey, that's our oil and, and Israel's saying, I don't think so. And, uh, and, and here's Russia down in all this, you know, and how are they going to get involved? And nobody quite honestly knows what we're doing, but that's, that's another story. Uh, don't want to get too political here today. But, uh, you know, so what, what's going on? Don't everything that's, that's, that's uh, everything's going on and, and it's so crazy. And then a lot of people now, because of this, are, are uh, a lot of, a lot of uh, prophetic teachers that believe that the, the Gog-Magog uh, prophecy of Ezekiel 38 and 39 applies to Russia. I'm not sure whether they're correct or not, but there's some, there's some debate about, about that. But, uh, but the, the prophecy in Ezekiel 38 and 39 is about how, these, uh, how Gog, who is the leader of Magog, will come down out of the north and he will attack Israel in the last days. And, and you know, I'm not one of these that tries to uh, set dates you know, for the return of Jesus and stuff. Uh, uh, but, and, and, I, and I don't know if everybody listening to this message has punched your ticket for heaven or not, but you just might want to consider doing so uh, because, uh, I mean, I don't know if this is the end or not or if we're getting close to the return of Christ or anything like that, but I know if we're, if we're not, we, we, we've sure missed a good opportunity for it because it, it sure looks a lot like when you read in Scripture uh, about some of the prophecies and, and you could say, well, everybody has often throughout the throughout history has interpreted it. And that's true. I'm not... I'm not saying Jesus is coming back uh, tomorrow. Wouldn't hurt my feelings if he did. I'm not saying Jesus is coming back tomorrow. I'm just saying that there's a lot of stuff going on in the world, uh, and a lot of it centers right in that part of the world that uh, that has a lot to do with end times uh, prophecy. It's just a, it's it's serious serious business. Serious serious business. Speaking of business, y'all ever have somebody? stick their nose into your business? <laughs> Apparently so. <laughs> that response. Don't you hate that? Don't you hate it when people stick their nose in your business? You do realize that that's exactly what the secular world accuses followers of Jesus of doing. When we stand up and say something is is sin. Something is wrong. This is not right. This is not what God says. That's exactly what the secular world accuses followers of Jesus of doing. Sticking your nose in somebody else's business. Let's talk about that some, shall we? All right, turn your uh, open your Bibles to James chapter 4. We're uh, finishing up James chapter 4 today. Uh, we'll be about two weeks is the plan in James chapter 5, and then we will finish this, this uh, building on the basics, this, this building block of faith, and then we'll move on to hope after that in First and Second uh, Peter. But uh, this, this, 
building block of faith. Do you think you need faith for life? Absolutely. And I think one of the things that has come clear throughout James' teaching is that faith is not just some, you know, mystical concept. It's not just some intellectual thing that, that, that faith, if one thing James has, made, James has made clear, it is that your faith has to be something substantial. It has to be something that you actually stand on, live on, uh, operate on, or it's not actually authentic biblical faith. That, I mean, that's, if you've been here through this series, if you haven't got anything else, I hope that you've gotten that James is over and over and over again and says, hey, if your faith is real, this is what it ought to do, and this is how it ought to look, and this is what you ought to be in your life, and this is what ought not be in your life. I mean, he just, he's just calling it like that. James chapter 4, and uh, we're in verse 11, and I'm going to read uh, through the end of the chapter, verse 17. I got uh, one more week on the crutches, uh, supposedly, uh, uh, Lord willing. And, um, and then I'm going to be able to move around some, and I'm looking forward uh, to that. I know we're in the middle of the chapter, but, uh, but if you were here two weeks ago, you may remember we left off in verse 10. Now verse 11 picks up, and he says, Do not speak against one another, brethren. He who speaks against a brother or judges his brother speaks against the law. And judges the law. But if you judge the law, you're not a doer of the law, but a judge of it. There's only one lawgiver and judge, the one who is able to save and to destroy. But who are you who judge your neighbor? Come now, you who say, Today or tomorrow we will go to such and such a city and spend a year there and engage in business and make a profit. Yet you do not know what your life will be like tomorrow. You're just a a vapor. Appears for a little while and then vanishes away. Instead, you ought to say, if the Lord wills, we will live and also do this or that. But as it is, You boast in your arrogance. All such boasting is evil. Therefore, to one who knows the right thing to do and does not do it, to him it is sin. Father, today as we uh, look at this uh, important passage of Scripture, and and it always always is, all of it's important, but uh, James has kind of laid out at the beginning what faith ought to look like, and then seems like as he moves towards the end, he's giving some practical examples of how that faith is lived out. And one is in this area of uh, judgmentalism and judging others or uh, sticking our nose where it doesn't belong uh, kind of thing. And I ask for your wisdom, for your clarity, uh, based not on our personal feelings, not based on, uh, on uh, polls that are taken, but based only on the truth of your word. What I want, uh, Father God, what I ask for uh, every week is that what I'll say today is based uh, first and foremost on your word, is empowered by your spirit, and is effective to your people. That they will leave here with a different perspective or a different idea or a reinforced perspective based on what they had before. Uh, God, uh, all the time, I know this is true. None of this makes any difference. From Genesis to Revelation, uh, if people don't apply it, if I don't apply it, if we don't apply it, then then our studying of it is not not what it should be. So uh, help us as we walk through this today. Teach us, and may we leave here better prepared, better equipped, better followers of our Savior, the Lord Jesus. And it's in his name that we pray today. Amen. Okay, thank you so much for being here. Let's start uh, with this idea. I got a couple ideas I want to share with you. First one is this. Leave to God what is God's business. You got to leave to God what is God's business. Now, it is uh, amazing that uh, people, uh, it's, that many people, that don't give a rip about biblical ideas or biblical standards or uh, biblical application to the life, people that don't give any credence to any of that stuff suddenly become 
biblical scholars when you move on to the subject of judgmentalism. Have y'all noticed that? I mean, they, they you know, I, I've known people that didn't, couldn't tell you anything about the Bible, but, but suddenly bring up this idea of, of judging someone, and, and, and they're, they're biblical scholars. They're even quoting in the, in the King James. Judge not, lest ye be judged, brethren. Right? Oh, you, you can't judge. Don't, don't judge. And let's face it, that, that, that is the culture in which we live. Is it not? I mean, it's okay to say it's the culture in which we live. That uh, the mantra of our culture seems to be, really, um, that uh, what I do or you do or anyone else does is none of your business as long as what they do does not hurt anyone else. That's the little caveat that's always put at the end of it. As long as it doesn't hurt anyone else, then it's none of your business. And if you, uh, if you declare what they're doing as wrong, if you denounce what someone is doing as wrong, you're judging. Can't judge. Don't judge. You, you, you're, not, you're not supposed to judge. Both Jesus' teaching on judge not, lest you be judged, and James' teaching on the subject of judgment. Both of them have been, in my opinion, based on Scripture, they have been abused and misused by people that would want to promote the idea that no one ever has a right to say that what someone else does is wrong. And most people would say, amen, that's right. That's right. Only God has that right. Basing their idea, uh, their definition of judgment on the idea that no one can, can, just, can declare what is wrong or what is sin. What we have to understand, though, is that the biblical concept of judgment is different from that. The biblical concept of judge is very different from, from how the world would tend to interpret the phrase or the term or the, the, the idea of judge or judging. The biblical concept would, would probably look something like this. The biblical concept of judge is the one who decides what is right and wrong. You can fill in blanks if you like to do that on the, on the back of your program. The biblical concept of judge is the one who decides what is right and wrong and then determines what the penalty or the consequence is for doing wrong. That is the judge, the one who decides what is right or what is wrong. I mean, from the biblical perspective. Decides what is right and what is wrong, and then determines what the, the penalty or the consequence of that wrong is. Now, most people would have no problem with, with that, with what I just said. Most people would say, amen, that's right. You don't have the right to judge me. Only God can judge me. Which may surprise some of you, but I don't have a problem with that. I don't have a problem with understanding that I have, do not have the, the right to determine what is sin or what the consequences of those sins are. But, Here's probably a better way to understand it. We do not have the right to decide or to determine what is sin or its penalty, but we do have the responsibility to declare what God has decided is sin. Do you understand? Do you see the difference? We do not have the right to decide or determine what sin is or the consequence of that sin, but we have the responsibility to declare what is sin. And I use the word responsibility because that's exactly what it is, ladies and gentlemen. We have the responsibility. Listen, get that at it before we move on. We have the responsibility to declare what God has decided is sin. Now, if you don't believe me, look at what the prophet Ezekiel says. Ezekiel chapter 33. This is God speaking, and he says, When I say to the wicked, O wicked man, you will surely die. In other words, when God announces 
hey, this is sin or that is sin. When God makes this, deter, deter, this declaration of what, what sin is, when he determines what sin is, and, I, and I, when I say to the wicked man, you will surely die. In other words, he's wicked because he's sinful. He's acting in sin. And you do not speak to warn the wicked from his way. Now, who's the you? Yeah. Yeah. And you do not speak to warn the wicked from his way. That wicked man shall die in his iniquity. He's responsible for his sin. He doesn't doesn't get off just because you didn't say anything to him. He or she is a sinner, and, and, and the consequences of that sin are on them. Whether you tell them or do not tell them. But if you don't tell him, yeah, he dies in his iniquity. But his blood I will require from your hand. From your hand. Now listen, I, I, I'll be the first to say that. I've said this before when I've, when I've looked at Ezekiel 33. And I've, I've used this verse many times when, when discussing uh, the, the mission of the church. I'll be the first to say that I, I don't know what all that means. To say that, 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 we're, that their blood is on our heads. That, that we're responsible for people that, that we have the opportunity to share with and, and we do not share with. All I know is that, that's God speaking. And God is the one who says, their, their blood I will require at your hands. But if you on your part warn a wicked man to turn from his way, and he does not turn from his way, he still dies in his iniquity. But you have delivered your life. In other words, you're, you're not guilty of the charge against you of not sharing with those the fact that, hey, this road you're going down is wrong. It's sinful. God is, not, is opposed. It is not what God wants for your life. Listen, that's why... Really, there are two reasons why I'm all the time, and y'all get tired of hearing it, I'm sure, I'm sure you do. Broken record. Here comes broken record clay. That's why I'm always pushing you to invite people, to share your testimony, to give out iVite cards, to uh, look for opportunities and ways that you can engage people with the good news of Jesus. One, because they are sinners. We all are. What does Romans 3.23 say? All of sin. And come short of, of the glory of God, the standard of God. So they need to hear the message of Christ. And, and I should be compelled to get, give that to them. But number two, because you and I are responsible. Whatever all to have their blood on our heads, hands and head means, you and I are responsible to, to, to engage, to go on mission, to to look for ways to share, to speak up when somebody says, well, da, 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 da. That, that, that's on us. No, we do not have the right to decide what is sin or determine what the consequences of sin are, but we absolutely have the responsibility to declare what is sin. You understand? Those of us that are old enough to remember it, it's, it's only been 10 years, but some of you would have been too, too young. Back in 2005, uh, Hurricane Katrina slammed into the city of New Orleans. 175, up to, right at 175 mile per hour winds. Direct hit on the city of New Orleans. By the time it was finished, over 1,800 people had died. And nothing but utter, total devastation left in the wake of that storm. Now, I don't know if you remember this, but there were more than one uh, evangelist, TV uh, personality, uh, even pastors, who uh, decided that, that, that Hurricane Katrina was God's judgment on the city of New Orleans for its wickedness. Do some of y'all remember that? You remember some of the reports that some of them, them said it's because New Orleans is such a wicked city and God is judging the wickedness of that city and God's sending his judgment on, this, on the city through Hurricane Katrina. Now, you can find biblical examples of, of God bringing judgment down on a city or, or on a people because of their wickedness, because of their sin. But ladies and gentlemen... That's God's call, not ours. We do not have the right to decide or to determine. We have the responsibility to declare and say, hey, listen, 
God's got a better plan for your life. What you're doing now is contrary to his will. But we do not have the right. That's God's. We're not qualified. Think of it this way. Think of it this way. The only person that would really have the right to determine the weight limit of a bridge would be a structural engineer, really, or someone that that worked in that field. I don't know the weight limits of of concrete, do you? I don't know the, the stress limits of steel. I don't know how far... Uh, spans have to be across a bridge or what the life expectancy is of I don't know those kind of things I'm not qualified to make that call but a structural engineer is he knows those things but if the structural engineer says to me Clay here's the limit here's how much can go across this bridge anything that that's over that limit the bridge will come crashing down If the structural engineer leaves me with that responsibility, I am, listen, I am criminally negligent if I do not warn people as they approach that bridge. Hey, whoa, you're over the limit. It's going to come crashing down on you. You can't, don't, don't do this. Don't go there. Don't try and cross this. This is wrong. I, wouldn't I have to speak up? What kind of human being would I be if I would not speak up and warn those? Do you understand what I'm saying? Okay, so, so what's the takeaway for us? If James is not... And by the way, we know James is not saying... Here's how we know James is not saying that you shouldn't point out sin. We know that he's not saying that because James does it from chapter 1 to chapter 4. That's all he's doing constantly. Including here in chapter 4 and verses 2. You lust and do not have, so you commit murder. You're envious and you can obtain, so you fight and you quarrel. Uh, you adulteresses. Oh. I don't know, James. Sounds pretty judgmental. So James, we know that James can't be saying you shouldn't point out to people what is sin so that they understand what God's expectations are on their life. You just don't have the right to to decide what is the sin and you don't have the right to determine what the consequence. So what's the takeaway for us? What is is James saying? Well, this, this, this may seem hard for some of you to believe. But some... Church people have been known to be a little judgmental. For instance, and I've told this story, some of you have heard this story before, but uh, years ago, this was years and years ago, long before I was in ministry, uh, I was on an outreach team at at my my home church in Florida, and uh, a lady had visited our church the Sunday before, and she had filled out a, a, a form, which we really appreciated her doing, guests. So uh, we really appreciate it. So she visited us, and she indicated on the card that she would like a visit. So we went to visit her. She was very pleasant. She was very nice. She invited us in. She said, yeah, come on, sit down. And, uh, and so, you know, we're doing follow-up and just seeing where, where she was and all that sort of thing. And uh, it was the first time she'd ever been uh, to that church. I'm sure she'd been to some other church before, but the first time she'd ever been to that church. And, uh, and she was very polite and, like I said, had to sit down and offer us something to drink, all that kind of good stuff. But in very short order... Uh, when we asked her what she thought of the service or how she liked or whatever, in very short order, very politely, she uh, indicated to us that she would never uh, enter that church again. And uh, so, naturally, we asked, really? <laughs> why, why is that? What was it about it? And she told us that uh, she got there early. She sat down, which, which oftentimes guests tend to get there earlier. Some of y'all just come in whenever, you know, or halfway through worship, but I, whatever. I'm not judging. I'm not judging. And, uh, and she said, I came in. She said, I sat down, and uh, two, two ladies came and sat down in front of her. They'd come in from the back, and they sat down in front of her. And there was another entrance in the auditorium uh, at, towards the front side on either side, and they saw a lady come in from the front, uh, another lady that I guess they knew, and uh, this was not her name, but uh, I don't remember her name. But, but the, the two lady, the, the lady that was the guest, heard the two ladies sitting right in front of her say, well, look at that dress that Tammy Johnson has on. If I didn't have anything better to wear than that, I just wouldn't even come to church. And she said she stayed through the service, but she left. And she said, I'll, ne- I'll never go to that church again. It, it is that idea 
that somehow I'm better than somebody else. That's what James is talking about here. The idea that somehow I'm better than somebody else because I don't do this, or this is not my sin, or I don't struggle with that, or I, or I wear this kind of clothing, or I don't... You understand what I'm saying? Is that idea of judgmentalism that, that I think just drives God crazy when His people, the people who profess to be His, act that way. Of course... Y'all all know there, most of you know this, the perfect modern day example of that would be this, you already know, don't you? This Westboro Baptist Church out there in Topeka, Kansas. You know what I'm saying? The nut jobs, Clay, you're judging. Yes. <laughs> Stay with me. Agree with me and it's not really judging. It's just we're coming <laughs> to consent. The nut jobs, listen to me, the nut jobs that go and protest at the funerals of soldiers and, and, and victims of mass murders and stuff like that. Now, I, I, I was looking, I, I don't even, even have Tyler, I didn't want to bring pictures of him up, so it just, because it just so disturbs me. But uh, I saw this, uh, one of recent protests they had, one guy's holding up a sign that said, Planes crash and God laughs. Another one said, God sent the shooter. Now, I'm, I'm going to ask you, how warped, how demented, how unbelievably hard do you have to be to spew out that kind of ungodly, unforgiving, judgmental attitude? And what makes it a thousand times worse is that they do it in the name of God. They stand up and do it in the name of God. And I'm telling you, God hates it. It's just this attitude of judgmentalism. No, listen, we do not have, we do not have that right. Leave to God what is his business. Does God hate sin? Yes. Should we warn people of sin? Yes, because of the consequences and the damage that it does to them physically, spiritually, emotionally, uh, every way, and to God's creation. Absolutely we should. But not, not, with, not with bitterness, not with arrogance, not with pride, but with humility, with compassion for people who are caught up in a, in, in a life that is contrary to what God wants. That's how God does it. Look at, it. Look at Ezekiel again, Ezekiel chapter 18. Do you think, this is God speaking again, do you think I like to see wicked people die? This is God speaking. Do you think, you think this is something I, I, I want to see? you think I want to see them die in their sin like this? Says the sovereign Lord. Of course not. I want them to turn from their wicked ways and live. That's what God wants. That's what we should want. With compassion. With humility. With a burden and a heart for people who need a relationship with Jesus. Listen, I know we've got to move on. But the next time you are tempted to to have a judgmental attitude towards somebody. And I, listen, any of us can go down that road. Can I get an amen? The next time we are tempted to get a judgmental attitude towards somebody, you might just remember, there but by the grace of God go you, go I, me. Look at this. I, I want you to see this. First Corinthians chapter 6. Apostle Paul, listen to what he says. He says, surely you know that the people who do uh, wrong will not inherit God's kingdom. So he's, he's, he's spelling it out. Sin separates you from God. That's very clear. Uh, do not be fooled. Those who sin sexually, and by the way, this is not an exhaustive list of sin. All right? He's just, he's just, he's just naming stuff that is a problem in people's lives. Those who sin sexually, worship idols, take part in adultery. Those who are male prostitutes or men who have sexual relations with other men. Those who steal, are greedy, get drunk, lie about others or rob. These people will not inherit God's kingdom. Now, it probably, you know, at a, at a good Baptist uh, Sunday, you know, it's like, Amen! That's right! Preach it! In the past, some of you were like that. But you were washed clean, you were made holy, and you were made right with God in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and the Spirit of our God. 
That's how we ought to be. Humble, thankful, compassionate for those around us. Leave to God what is His business. Here's the second idea for this morning. I'm going to try and wrap it up here real quickly. Look to God for your business. You just leave to God what is His business, but you look to God for what is your business. I want to read it again, verse 13, uh, because it's been a while since we looked at it. Uh, Come now, you who say today or tomorrow we will go to such and such a city and spend a year there and engage in business and make a profit. Yet you don't know what your life will be like tomorrow. You're just a vapor that appears for a little while and vanishes away. Instead, you ought to say, if the Lord wills, we will live and also do this or that. But as it is, you boast in your arrogance. The arrogance being that you're just living your life. You're not even considering God or what his plans are. You're just, you're just doing your thing. and Therefore, you, you boast in your arrogance. All such boasting is evil. Therefore, to one who knows the right thing to do and does not do it, to him it is sin. I love the fact that James ties these two ideas together. The idea that judging others and, and their lives, having a judgmental attitude about that, and then he ties it in with your own life. It's as if James is saying, listen, you got plenty of stuff of your own that you got you to gotta mess with. Now again, that doesn't mean that we, that we don't, if we care about people, we will, we will share with them what God's Word says. But it's like he says, listen, well, you, let, let's, let's just focus on your own life for a few minutes. I'm pretty sure this has to be the place where the phrase, Lord willing, comes from, right? I even said it earlier this morning. Did y'all catch it? Lord willing. Uh, Lord willing, we're, we're going we're gonna to build that building. Uh, we're going to come see y'all, at, uh, Lord willing, right? Nothing wrong with that. But listen, a- adding the Lord willing on the front end or the, the back end of, of a phrase, it's, it's not some magical incantation that you can just speak and, yeah, and that, that's going to make it happen. You, you understand, right? The idea here is that what is God's will for my life? God willing. James says, look, well, what, who, who do you think you are? You're talking about, oh, well, you know, uh, uh, next year I'm going to do this and, and I'm going to do that and I'm going to do whatever. Listen, I don't have time to go into it all. Just, let, just hear me say, this is not an argument against not planning, okay? It's okay to have a retirement plan, a 401k, if you've got anything left in it. You know, it's, 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 it's okay. You know, it, this is not an argument against that. The argument is against people that just totally leave God out of the equation. And they say, well, I'll do this and I'll do that. And, and Jane... <laughs> <coughs> Sorry, sorry, really. <laughs> James says, are, are, you, are you omniscient? Do you know everything? Are you omnipotent? Do you have all the power there is? Are you omnipresent? Can you just be everywhere at one time? <laughs> you're, a, you're a mist. You're a vapor. You're a... <laughs> That's it, you're a... <laughs> On, on the timeline, to use that phrase, not really, wouldn't be actually accurate, but on the timeline of eternity, you're, f- what are you doing, he says. Instead, you ought to be, here, here's what we ought to be asking, God, what do you want? What is your will? What do you have in store for me, God? To include him in these plans. I, I, I used to know a guy, and he was wealthy, he was well off, he was, he was well off, had a big house, nice cars all that kind of stuff, and uh, he, he, was, he was a health fanatic, uh, you know, and, and this was a guy that professed his faith in Jesus and uh, came to church now and again, and uh, he, uh, he was a health, he took all these vitamins and nutritional things, and, and he, he was faithful in the gym and kept his body, and, and he was just a man up in age, and he took really good care of his body, and, and he used to tell him about all, the, all these plans, how he's going to make more money, and how he's going to do this, and he's going to do that, and the fact that, you know, he was taking care of his body. He didn't smoke. He didn't drink. Uh, you know, he, he didn't do, do any of that stuff. And uh, so, you know, he was taking good care of his body. And he was going to, so he was going to, had he was going to do this. And he planned to do that. And this is how he was going to expand his, his holdings. And this is that and this and, and all that kind of stuff. Until he got cancer and shriveled up to almost nothing and died. And now listen to me. I'm not, I'm not, God didn't do, I'm not saying God did that to him. We live in a sin-cursed world, and, and unfortunately, none of us are immune from, 
from adversity or tragedy coming into our lives. I'm not, I'm not talking about what God did or didn't do. What I'm talking about is a man that, that had, his whole, had his plans. You understand? He had his plans. He had his, what he was going to do. And God never seemed, and I don't know, I know I'm not with him with all this private prayer time, but just I'm just telling you in conversation with him, God never seemed to be the idea of what God might want, what God might want him to do with some of that money, how God might want him to, to go on mission, whatever. Those thoughts never seemed to come into his, his head. And, and, and James is just saying that, and this is not an insult to any of y'all, because all of us can be guilty of this at times, I understand. But James says it is the height of, of arrogance and really stupidity to make your plans, your life plans, and leave God out of the equation. So it, it, is, it is coming to that idea of God, what do you want? What do you want for me? So that every situation in life, here, every situation in life, um, a, a a geographical move, a, a, a new job opening, a, a decision to have a, another child, or you know, a, a thousand things that you can think about for your life should start with that one question. God, what do you want? I have discovered in however many years of ministry, I have discovered that the majority of believing followers of Jesus good intention, but I've discovered that a majority of people tend to order their life by the physical and the spiritual fits in there somewhere. What James is saying, you've got it absolutely backwards. It should center on the spiritual and the physical fits into it there. God, what do you want? God, where do you want me to go to school? God, what do you want me to do for a living? God, what do you want? Do you want me to take this job? God, what do you... And I know some of you are probably thinking, well, I, you know, I try. I, I try to, you know, when times come up and there's certain situations and, and I, you know, I've got a crisis or I've got to, I, you know, I try to pray. I, I try to talk to God about it. Well, whoop de doo Aren't you special for relegating God to the damage control officer of your life? Sorry, it sounded a little judgmental, didn't it? Sorry. But I, th I think you understand the idea, what, what James is, is saying here. Listen, God doesn't want to be the damage control officer on your ship. He is the captain. God is, if you have professed faith in Jesus Christ, he is the CEO of your life. Not because he didn't have anything better to do, but because he wanted better for you. So he decided to do that for you. So it's absolutely foolish. It's absolutely asinine. Can I say that word in church? Is that okay? It's absolutely asinine to leave God out of the equation of your life. Instead, you should start with that very idea. God, what do you want? And listen, I know, I know what we want. We want like, okay, I want you to leave the house at 7.30 tomorrow morning. I want you to take a left on Auburn Avenue. And I want, you know, we want, right? We want all the details. We want the specifics. We want, I want you to, to uh, take this job. I want you, we want that. And, and it doesn't always come that way. It doesn't always come immediately. It sometimes comes through a process, an agonizing process of prayer and seeking God's face. But listen, if, if, you, if you will listen, here's what God will say to you. And some of you have read this many times. Prophet Jeremiah, Jeremiah chapter 29, I say this because I know what I am planning for you, says the Lord. Now listen, let those words sink into your heart, your life right now with your uncertainty, with your certainty, with your doubts, with your fears, with your anxieties, with your future, with, with everything. Because I know what I am planning for you, says the Lord. I have good plans for you, not plans to hurt you. I will give you hope. And a, say it, good future. Now listen, I understand in the context that God is talking to the nation of Israel and, and what he had planned for them. But I see absolutely, I see biblically absolutely no reason why that would not apply to each and every one of our lives. And it doesn't mean that there's not adversity. It doesn't mean there's not tragedy. It doesn't mean there's not hard times. It doesn't mean that's not what it means. But what it says 
what it's meaning is that if you will seek his face, but Clay, you don't know what's going on in my life. I know. But he does. If I were you, I wouldn't come to me either, but I'd go to him. You understand what I'm saying? He does. And I absolutely believe God has great plans for all of us, for our lives, and what he wants to do. Leave to God what is his business. Look to God for what is your business. And you will enjoy life so much more than you can possibly imagine. Let's pray. What a great lesson to learn. God cares about our lives and wants to be involved in our business. As Pastor Clay mentioned today, many people want to seek God for the big stuff, the hardships and trials of life. But as we've seen today in the book of James, God cares about all of our lives. He wants us to seek His will and wisdom for all of life's decisions. We hope you'll come join us on a Sunday morning at Cross Culture Church. We gather every week in a casual and contemporary atmosphere and celebrate the goodness of our God. Cross Culture may be a little different from what you're thinking. Sure, we're a church, but instead of religion, we're about relationships. A community of believers where Jesus is revealed in the lives of each person. Real people who truly care. Solid biblical teaching from Pastor Clay Stevens. And the most energetic, safe, and fun kids program around. Find out more at crossculturelife.org. I want to lead you to the cross. I want to lead you to the cross. Cross Culture Church, taking the cross to our culture and taking our culture to the cross.